Hey everybody, my name is John DePietro. And I'm Bob Zagami with the Camper Report Show. On today's Camper Report Show, I'm gonna be talking with a young couple that started full-timing in 2019 and said we're gonna do it for one year. And guess what? They're still on the road. That's great. That's a great story. Um, I've got, you know, if you remember last week, we talked a little bit about Campers Village that was being created by Wilkins RV. And I said, you know, I'm going to I'm going to try to get Brian Wilkins on the show to talk about that. Well, guess what? Today, I've got Brian Wilkins on the show to talk about Campers Village. It's going to be a great Camper Report show. Stay with us, everybody. Hey everybody, and welcome back to the news segment of the Camp Report Show. My name is John DiPietro. I'm here with Bob Zagami. Bob, there is there's economic news, there's consumer news, there's every kind of news imaginable in this week's Camp Report Show. But first, let's start with some fun. You know, our friends at RV Life, which is the parent company for this show, recently teamed up with our friends Joel Holland at Harvest Host and have come up with some Pretty humorous stories about camping. Talk a little bit about that feature. Yeah, they they, they did a contest, and uh, people were going to get uh, subscriptions or uh, membership in Harvest Host uh, and their related properties, and they they are going to be publishing a lot of these. and And the one that they published was, and I, I'm going to cap you know capsulize it because it's a little bit long, but it was a couple that went camping and stopped at a uh, Harvest Host Winery, as we all have done. And as they backed in their trailer, they heard, and they had China bombs, they had Chinese tires on the on the trailer. They knew that. They were watching it. They made sure all the tire pressure was right and everything and read it by the book. Well, they backed into the space behind the barn that the farmer gave them for the winery and all of a sudden heard this unbelievable loud noise. And he said, oh, the tires, the China bombs, the tires blew up. And he got out and went around to the back of the vehicle, and and the farmer is there. So he's looking for his blowout. The farmer says, I'm I'm sorry. He says, that was our corn cannon. And I didn't even know there was a corn cannon thing because I'm not a farmer. But it goes off periodically, automatically, to scare the cows to stay in a particular area. So the farmer says, let me shut that off for you. So that was, that was, that was the uh, winning story. It's a lot more elaborate. We can thought it was tires, but it thought it was tires and just exploded. Now the, the, the the last line that he had on the, the uh, consumer said, no, the farmer said, let me shut that thing off for you. Apparently, they have a corn cannon that blasts randomly to scare cows out of the field and our beers out of their shorts. So, but while and while we're dark. on Harvest Host, last last minute bit of news literally just came across the wires last night. Harvest Host has how, how would they say it finished? Or catapulted. Been, catapulted. 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 You, you know, we've all seen the ink. 5,000 list for years, years. And out of nowhere, Harvest Host comes up and is number 70 on the Inc. 5,000 fastest growing companies in the country, over 5,000% growth in just the three years since Joel Holland has purchased it. And I was going to try to get him on the show, but he is celebrating up in alaska this week so we'll 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 have he's in alaska back on on the show soon but that is an absolutely amazing accomplishment because he bought a very great company a very great concept and he just exploded it company. yep and yep over seven thousand places now between harvest host boondockers welcome golf clubs seven thousand places that rvs can camp Free of charge. Not, I don't want to call camp. Over you pay one, one annual fee. One annual fee. Yep. Uh, but the beauty of it is, and, and we're staying in one this weekend. You know, as this show airs, we will be in one up in upper New York State. But the uh, beauty of it is, is that you get to meet other campers, but you get to be kind of off the beaten path, um, whether it's a farm, whether it's a winery, whether it is a golf course. Um, you meet Really cool people, uh, unlike the normal tourist spots where um, 
you know, you just come and go. I mean, you get to meet people and and it's fun. Harvest hosts and RV life. Read all about it. We'll put the link. We'll put the link right here. And, and then, uh, uh, all of our stories on this section come to you from our friends at RV Business and Woodall's Campground Magazine. So it's right. a great, great way to start off the exactly. show this week. So what else we got? So we got another thing called, um, and, and it's a new phrase that I've never heard before. It's called consumer sentiment. Now, that's not to be confused with consumer sediment, which you find in the black tank at your campground. Consumer sentiment. And Bloomberg did a big story about it, Bob. You found that. So since you found it, you explain it to our people. Well, it's it's kind of based on some statistical data, but how consumers actually feel. So you can read all the reports and Depending on the report, you know, liars figure and, and figures can lie. lie. You know, yep. if one side says it this way, the other side's going to tell you how bad it is and, and vice versa. But this measures consumer sentiment. And uh, the cost has costs have risen 5% over the, the, next, the next year, which is the lowest since February. So if you read into this and, you know, everybody wants to talk about inflation and high costs, the fact of the matter is, the, the barometers that consumers look at are very favorable to an increase in consumer purchases. And they're like, you know, as consumers feel good. And a lot of people have said that, that even though we have relation, inflation and high gas prices, people Bob, are still. We don't have inflation. have inflation. We don't right. have inflation. And besides, if we did, it would be eliminated with the Inflation Reduction Act, which we'll talk about in a second. But go ahead. I did interrupt you. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that's that's true too. But but the government figures uh, for the past week showed that the consumer prices rose eight point five percent in July, and from a year ago they're down from a forty year high, reflecting a drop in the energy cost. So we've seen the gas is coming down. Now I'm not saying we're out of the woods, and I'm not saying that inflation may not go. But it's but the consumers still feel good, which means they're working, they're making money, they're willing to spend their money. And I and I just finished a two day trip to visit a lot of our dealers here in New England, and every one of them reports that yes, the lot traffic is down, but the sales are pretty consistent. Yep, they're running pretty much where they were in 2019. They feel good. Their service departments are full. They're selling units. They're they're, they're fully stocked for this coming season. So. Consumer sentiment, the bottom line is consumers still feel very good about the RV industry and the RV lifestyle. Okay, so the headline for that segment, which you just talked about, is consumer sentiment high, consumer sediment down. And it's right. always good if you're an RVer that the sediment does go down. So and, with and that goes, being said... Goes the, and goes in the right tank. It goes in the right tank, exactly. And not out onto the ground. However... Yeah. Um, you know what? We're hearing more and more about this Inflation Reduction Act. And depending upon what side of the political coin that you fall on, and we're not going to talk about it here. Um, some people say um, it's got all about climate and emissions and all that other stuff. But there is um, our friends at RV Business did a story that they found about what impact this Inflation Reduction Act will have on the RV industry. Enlighten us, Professor of economic Sagami. Well, I, I tell you, it is, uh, again, it's it's how you can read some of these things, but in the midst of the, the, the bottom line is it's not going to reduce inflation. It's a terrible name, but there are some hidden gems in the bill. Well, and some are not necessarily gems in terms of, you know, most everybody have read about the uh, 15% minimum corporate tax. So any company who's earning over a billion dollars in profit calculated over a three-year period are going to have a 15 percent minimum ta minimum corporate tax and if people think that corporations are not going to pass that pass on, it on that's <laughs> that's going to be a negative for it but also corporations have been avoiding taxes since they wrote the first tax code everything that these corporations are doing is completely legal it's up to Congress to change the rules. So if they think that these corporations aren't going to take their bank of lawyers and figure out how to get around this particular item, they will they will do it. They they've got the lawyers, they've got the lobbyists. So will we see that? Maybe not. Um, but the other one was 
it does it does waver over into that climate change. There's more things about climate change in this bill than there are inflation. And it's 370 billion in new spending to combat climate change. But the one of the examples is there's a seventy five hundred dollar credit for electric vehicles, and they removed a cap limiting that benefit to only the first 200,000 vehicles sold by the manufacturers. So now there's no cap on that. And, but the bottom line is as soon as this bill came out and consumers felt good for a little while saying that they could get a $7,500 credit if they buy an electric vehicle, the very next morning, all of the major manufacturers raised the price on all of their electric vehicles. Guess by how much, John? $7,500. Yep. So we're going to raise the price and then we're going to give you a cap. We're no better off yep. either way. Well, the interesting aspect of that whole thing, Bob, and I own an electric vehicle and um, I bought it a couple months ago. So I got the full credit. I got the full benefit from it. Now, we've been talking for over a year now about this Ford Lightning. Okay. This pickup truck, a uh, electric powered pickup truck to pull RVs. I'm my understanding is that there will be no tax credit on that vehicle. So what incentive is there for anyone to go electric? So, you know what? I'm not this is not a political show and it's not an economic show, but the reality is is that the good part about climate change is this. RV parks and campgrounds in the north will be able to stay open year round with global warming. The that's a good point. That's a good point. They, so, I bet they never thought of that before. No, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure about the, the tax credit not applying to the uh, Lightning. I haven't heard that. So we'll, yep. we'll have, yep. to, have to watch that. Well, it's uh, all over. The, it's all over the um, the uh, Facebook groups about electric vehicles today. These yeah, people are ripping. If it's, and, so if it's on Facebook, it's true. Now we know. Oh, it's totally true. It's absolutely totally true. And the beautiful part about Facebook is that you can post a question and get two opposite answers, but they're both true. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, also in the bill, there was a good thing as far as uh, older people, Medicare would be allowed to negotiate drug prices. The bill caps out-of-pocket drug uh, costs for seniors uh, at $2,000 per year. And let's face it, there are a lot of seniors that are RVs. There are a lot oh. of them that are full-timing that were getting hurt by inflation and the higher prices. So that's that's a good plus. It's, it's going to yeah. help everybody. Yeah. Uh, from a, an RVA standpoint, there is also $500 million for national parks and public lands uh, for conservation purposes. There's another $200 million for National Park Service deferred maintenance that has got a big, big note attached yep. to that one because they and, haven't done it. been deferred for about years. 25 years. Yep. And another $500 million to hire employees to serve in the national park system. Uh, or National Historic or Scenic Trails, uh, that's going to be administered by the National Park Service. Right. So right away, there's, there's $1.2 billion towards national parks. But Bob, the thing you're not saying is there's an asterisk next to that about those people that are going to serve in the national park system. It's only a seasonal job, but the other months that they're not working for the national parks, there will be IRS agents. Well, that's true. because they, so, they Full in, employment. They, they have to know how to shoot a gun and use up all that uh, ammunition that well, the IRS is buying. Yeah, but that's that's in case they get attacked by a bear or something at Yellowstone. They have to be armed. Well, that's a good point, John. Okay. So and you know what? We delivered the news better than the national networks delivered the news. That's right. Day because we know we're joking. The national networks are serious <laughs> and they give us more convoluted information than we just gave to our audience right here where bob on the camper report show stay with us everybody we've got two great stories coming up and special thanks to our friends at rv business and woodall's campground magazine for getting us all our all our material we'll be right back with more mike here from rv blogger don't waste hundreds of dollars on an external gps for your rv all you need to do is download the rv life app right onto your phone. This app is so cool, it has RV GPS built right into it. So you can load all the specific measurements and weights for your RV. It'll give you directions safe for your RV to follow. And by the way, if you have RV Trip Wizard, directions for your trips upload into this GPS automatically. 
All right. Welcome back, everybody, to the Camper Report Show. And my guest today is Brian Wilkins, president of Wilkins RV. And uh, if you remember from last week's show, we talked about Camper's Village and said, I'm going to try to get Brian on the show. And uh, he was quickly accommodating. And so we we have him now. Brian, great to see you again and uh, looking forward to talking to you here. Yeah, great to see you too, Bob. Yeah. So um, let's talk a little bit about the, you know, some folks that may not know about Wilkins RV, give us a little bit of the history and uh, go back to where you took over also and your dad ran it, but uh, let the folks know about Wilkins RV. Yeah, absolutely. Um, History that we're pretty proud of. So I'm third generation. My grandfather started the business in the 1930s as a auto detail shop and kind of progressed through the years of doing auto repair, used cars, um, and then eventually RVs. Uh, my dad took over the second generation owner in the uh, early 60s and um, got into Shasta and Coachman, uh, was a big Mallard dealer back in the day. Um, and then I stepped in and, and bought the business in 2004. I started working in it full-time in 95. So I worked in it for 10 years um, well, worked in it full time for 10 years uh, before I purchased. And uh, so I purchased in 2004. Um, we moved into our current location in Bath, New York in 2006. Um, that's a 20 bait uh, service center, full showroom, um, 50,000 square foot building. I mean, a, a really nice facility. Uh, and that's our main location. That's where we do all of our accounting out of. Um, 2011, we entered the Rochester market with our second location on the west side in Churchville, New York. Um, we built a new facility there that we opened in 15. In 2017, we bought the old Ballantine RV um, that gave us a site on the east side of Rochester, plus got our foot into the Syracuse market. Uh, this past fall, we added stores five and six, buying the great outdoors, two locations in the Syracuse market. And then this past June, we bought Jim's RV in Nichols, New York, which is the Binghamton market. And that's store number seven. Wow. So you're a major player in that whole New York, Pennsylvania type area. That's Yeah, you know, we, we have a big belief in, in the central New York market. And, you know, we've just tried to position ourselves where we've got good, convenient service locations and obviously sales locations. But, you know, a big piece of it is the service locations and having the service locations spread out so you can provide that convenient after um, after the sale support to, to our customers. Tell us a little bit about Campers Village. Uh, I was intrigued seeing the uh, press release on it. I love the concept, but uh, tell us a little bit about it, how it came about, and uh, what you think it's going to do for your sales effort. Yeah, so this is a new concept to us, and uh, and we're we're pretty excited to to see what it's all about and how, how it goes over. And uh, so I'll give you a little bit of history on it. So Bill Clark and Jerry uh, Fitzgerald were the owners of Great Outdoors. And my understanding is uh, this was a concept that that um, that uh, Jerry was the idea guy, and then Bill was kind of the execution guy, I think. <laughs> um, but uh, but they came up with this idea of having an outdoor wooded showroom where consumers could see the art, see see RVs in their environment. Um, so out back of their dealership, they had uh, some woods, um, and they went out and I don't know the exact acreage offhand that they that they developed but um you know they created some roads into the woods created some side uh roads off from the side roads there's there's mock campsites uh they put electric in um they put a pond in that's in the middle of it um there's a little barn out there uh there's a outdoor fireplace um so we can put i would say comfortably 30 to 40 rvs out there um parked as so like I said, it looks like you're walking through a campground, um, fire up the campfire. Um, so, so that's the concept. So it's really their concept. Uh, and then they hadn't used it the last couple of years. So we bought the, the business in, in fall of 2021. They hadn't used the, the campground concept in a couple of years. I think basically with COVID and, you know, hard to get people, there is a little bit of maintenance to it. 
Um, and it was just too much to do. Inventory is moving fast. So I think the concept just didn't make sense for a couple of years. Um, so, so it hadn't been, it hadn't been used. So we needed to get in there this spring and, and clean it up. And we had some trees we had to take down and um, basically just clean it up and get it ready to use again. Um, and uh, we've done that this spring. And uh, now we're, we're, we're going to open it up to the, we, we've had some campers in there for probably about 30 days, but uh, the next weekend we're going to do a, a, a promotion that uh, basically we're going to do a 28 hour sale. Um, it's going to start noon on Friday and run through Saturday at five. That's Friday, Friday, Friday the 19th. Uh, Friday the 19th through Saturday the 20th. Yep. Friday night, we're going to operate until we're, we're, we're saying 10 o'clock at night, but we're preparing to be there as late as we need to um, because we want to, to us, that's <clears throat> kind of the cool part is having it at night where, where the lights are on, the campfire is going, um, uh, you know, cooking some marshmallows, it, it, just all that fun stuff. So we're going to get some grills fired up around dinner time um, and, uh, and and have some fun with it. Um, yeah, it I'll tell you, if I, if I didn't have plans for next weekend, I would drive up because <laughs> it sounds like a great concept. The other, the other thing that in looking at it, do you see this also as a, a vehicle to sell more parts and accessories? And I was, when you set them up, in the campground environment, if you have chairs and tables and outdoor sure. grills, do you do you see this feeding a lot of business back in the store? And talk about the store because that's a that's a great store at that facility. Yeah, yeah, I do, and I think ultimately because it it the the outdoor showroom gives you or the wooded outdoor showroom gives you the ability to really paint the emotional picture of what the RVer is going to be doing. Right. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's in the woods, the awnings out, the doors opened up, you've got a patio mat underneath. You can talk about the grill. Um, you, you can just start talking. And then as you, like you say, as you're walking back into the dealership, You've got a nice 2,000 square foot uh, accessory store that, that's got all of that stuff. The accessory store carries kind of the same theme in that it's got a, a, a very outdoorsy um, uh, decoration to it. Uh, and so, yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, and in, in we've said for years, you, you know, and I've known you over 20 years now, it's it was a long journey to get RV dealers to really understand that we're selling the lifestyle, not the product. We had to go from that product mentality into the lifestyle, which of course the Go RV campaign helped a lot with. But what better way to talk to a client about the lifestyle when they're sitting in a chair in the woods, socializing? Number one, it's going to take a lot of pressure off them. They're not going to feel the pressure of the showroom or going from RV to RV, just looking at at products, but I think they'll let their hair down a little bit, but it, it's going to be able to form a much better relationship, I think, between your sales team and your prospects. Yeah, yeah we, we, we agree. Um, both the relationship, the emotional connection to, uh, to the lifestyle. Um, we, 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 we think that that's, we think that's what it drives. Yep. I, I, I would agree. Um, if it takes off, is this something that you have the land to do at some of your other places? Because it's, it's a big piece of land, but uh, do some of your other facilities also have that potential? Uh, we it, They don't. So th this will be a unique environment and, and we're OK with that. We, we think it's uh, we think that that's that's part of the attraction is is you can't go someplace else and shop in this way. Uh, yeah. so, so we, we, we want to keep it unique to this location. Yeah. It's a good competitive advantage. Right. Yeah. So from an overall business perspective, um, how is business and what do you see going from the balance of the year? We're coming up on Elkhart now. So the deals we placing orders, but, uh, most of my dealers are the, the traffic's are down a little bit, but the buyers are up a little bit. They, they, there's really been very little, uh, change on the buying habits. Yeah, we we would I would say that we feel we, we feel business is normalized. Um, you know, we're not at 2021 levels anymore. We're trending more in the more in the 2019 right. levels, and those were good levels. Um, like I said, they, they're not what they were, but they're good levels, um, and they're sustainable levels. And I think that's uh, that's really where we're at. Is 
is getting back to doing business in, in, in the normal environment and getting used to doing business in that normal environment. Um, I do feel better about things today than what I did probably 45 to 60 days ago. I feel we, we feel that just before um, 4th of July weekend, we saw a little bit of uptick in business and, and that that's sustained. Um, so so we're, we're positive about that. Um, and I think that's probably just the consumer. I, I think the environment's a little bit more stable now than what it was the first five months of the year. You know, it, it, we had we had a new war breakout. We had all kinds of talk about inflation. We talk about interest rates going up. Gas prices are going up. Um, there was just a, a lot of uncertainty. Uh, stock market was struggling. Um, a lot of uncertainty and all of that stuff is kind of stabilized now. And consume, the, the consumer likes stability, right? Right. Um, so I think that that's, I think that that's helped things, um, you know, as we go into the fall and going into next year, I think it's just, I think it's just, just about having the right expectation as to what the market's going to be. Um but, you know, don't we, we, we got to be careful to think there's more out there than what there actually is. No, well, I think the uh, the other thing that COVID did for our industry was it truly brought RVs into the mainstream discussion. I mean, there because so many people were talking about it on the press, on TV, in the media. So many people, you know, fifty percent of our buyers were new, first time buyers, and we have products from pop ups to forty five foot diesel pushers. So when you look at it, we have products for every budget. We have all kinds of products for every wherever they want to enter the RV lifestyle. And you can bet your life that any time the families now sit down to talk about going on vacation, they might talk about Disney World. They might talk about planes and, you know, get shaken up with that. They probably don't want to go on a cruise ship, but the RVs are going to be part of that discussion. And that, that's one of the exciting things about where the industry is, because it gives us a much broader base to choose from. Yep, I I, I agree. Um, I think uh I think the reality is, is that COVID probably brought some of 22, 23, 24 business forward and brought it into 2021. And it probably brought some non-RV business into 20 and 21. Yeah. And, but the fact that it brought some business forward might affect our market a little bit over the next couple of years. But, you know, if they bought their first unit, a year too early, then more than likely, hopefully they're going to buy their second unit a year too early, their third unit a year too early. Hopefully they're out spreading the word about RVing a year too earlier to their friends and family members. And hopefully it just, it, it helps the overall width of the market grow. Um, I, I, we don't feel that we're seeing an exodus from the industry. Um, nope. we, th we think we had a lot of people buy into the industry. And we think we've got a lot of customers that are enjoying it and are staying. And, you know, hopefully that means going forward that we're just a bigger industry than what we what we would have been otherwise. I agree. Our guest today has been Brian Wilkins, president of Wilkins RV. And Brian, we'll put the websites and locations and some of the graphics from your facilities and certainly one from Campus Village. I think we have a little drone footage that one of your staff members sent us that gives an overall view, but I wish you the best of luck with it. I, yeah. I wish I could come up with some s'mores on Friday night, but uh, got too much on the schedule, but great, great. Next time you're in the area, come on out and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll fire the campfire for you. Sounds good. All right, Brian, thanks very much. Thanks, Talk Bob. Take later. care. Yeah. yeah. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Camper Report Show. My name is John DePietro. And you know, in our never ending quest to bring you the most interesting RVers, we have gone beyond this time. And actually we've gone beyond the 303 to bring you the people, the family and the dog behind here who uh, are all part of a website called Exploring Outside the 303, and we want to welcome our friend Kaylee. Kaylee, 
Welcome to the Camp Report Show. Thank you so much for having me. You know, Kaylee, um, I was super intelligent and I knew 303 right away, but um, where did you come up with that name, Exploring Beyond the 303? Yeah, so we're actually Colorado natives, so born and raised. We, I had been in Colorado for like 35 years, <laughs> and uh, when my husband had finally decided or convinced me to go into this lifestyle, we were like, what should we name ourselves? And so since we were so focused on Colorado, um, that's kind of how the name uh, came about, because we wanted to get outside of Colorado, explore the country, and just see everything that's available out there. Yeah. And I understand you've been doing it, uh, what, right around September 1st, 2019? Does that sound right? Yes, that sounds right. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm told that he brought it up first, and then you called, you kind of told him he was crazy. Um, yes. And then he, um, you know, where'd you have your change of heart? Um, or well, change of it mind? Took me, yeah, it took me a whole year before I even like, like bought into it. And so God bless him. He is a very patient man. And so he had um, really uh, started diving into different YouTube channels and we started watching them like almost religiously. Um, and then I had started just following a bunch of other full-time families on like social media. And that to me was the biggest help to see that sane, normal people with families do this and they can thrive in this lifestyle. And that for me was like, a huge, just like helped me make the leap to go for it. Okay. So you had to tell your family, he had to tell his family, what was the initial reaction from the two, uh, the two other two sides. people in the family? Um, yeah. I think for the most part, people are like, you are crazy. But my mom was a hundred percent supportive. She was like, I wanted to do this when you guys were younger and you should absolutely do this. His like Steve's family was like, again, kind of like, they think you're crazy, but you know, you do, you have fun. And then my dad, um, it took him about a year after we had hit the road to finally accept it and like be cool with it. <laughs> okay. So now everybody's cool. Yes. Everybody's cool. Now, my other question is, um, tell us the ages of your children at the time and uh, then bring us up to date with now how they, uh, how they responded then and how they like it now. Yeah. So, um, well, that was, yeah, two years ago. So Jeremiah, we just had birthdays. <laughs> um, so Jeremiah was eight and Addie was six when we had first started and, um, and they were very excited about it. We hadn't homeschooled before. So that was like a big transition. Um, and so that was a bit of a struggle for us when we first started, cause we hit the road and started homeschool at the same time, which I totally That's right. do not September, recommend. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I do not recommend it. It was too much. <laughs> um, but now they're nine and 11 and they love it. They love homeschooling. They love making friends everywhere we go. Their little personalities have just been really shaped by us traveling. And uh, my son is like, he's still introverted, but he loves to go and make new friends. And it's just a, it's really brought our family a lot closer. And I love being involved in their schooling as well. Right. Now, when you, um, when you think of the homeschooling part, I mean, that's what a lot of people say, oh, we'll wait till, you know, if we have kids, we'll go back home. Or if we have kids, we will wait until, you know, they're, they've left the nest, that type of thing. I mean, you did the opposite of both of those. And, um, um, you know, I, I guess what, what homeschooled kids have told me is that when they go for a geography lesson, they see the Grand Canyon in real life. They see right. Mile High Stadium in real life. They see, you know, Yellowstone in real life, as opposed to looking at it online or an old geography book that is um, outdated by the time it's printed. Right. I think that's why I like this lifestyle so much, especially for the kids, is they are seeing and experiencing way more than mm -hmm. I ever did. And I traveled a lot as a kid, um, but like just the experiences, like the long durations that you get to be in these amazing locations, um, it just really kind of sinks it in further. It makes it just, I don't know, makes it really come to life. Right. Now, a lot of people, um, when we do these interviews with families and couples and, and, you know, extended families that have hit the road, everybody says, ask them what they're doing for revenue, because sometimes they have portable jobs and actually, you did it before COVID, so you were you were trailblazers. I mean, you didn't <laughs> use COVID as an excuse to hit the road. I mean, you you made some, you know, extra 
um, accommodations, right? Yes. Um, yeah, so Steve does purchasing for a plumbing wholesaler. Um, so, and then I'm an engineering consultant um, for my day job. And then I do content creation on the side as well. Um, but yeah, we were able to <laughs> convince our bosses to let us do this lifestyle for a year. And um, we had made commitments, like we have to be back in Denver or Steve does um, every so often to you know meet face to face. And um, we were able to just make it work and then COVID had hit. So we were already working remote we were already homeschooling and so our year has now turned into two and a half years at the moment with mm -hmm. no time that we even want to stop okay because that was my next question uh well let me let me go back and ask you do you wish you did it sooner yes without any hesitation you said yes yeah absolutely um i think um what i was raised was you you go to school, you go to college, you get married, you have kids, you buy a house, like you just follow this path. Yeah, and yeah. That's um, somebody else set for you. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And my parents had set that for me. And it's a great lifestyle. Um, but I felt very trapped. Um, and I always I'm a people pleaser at heart. And so I always want to just, you know, make my dad proud and make my mom proud. And like, you know, all those important people in my life. Um, but I think if my eyes would have been open to this as a real possibility, I think we would have done it sooner maybe even before we had kids mm. um but i don't know i just i would absolutely have i would have done it earlier i, I kind of wish we had um, but the timing was perfect god had the perfect timing for us with everything okay. um, that has happened how much longer i don't know um we <laughs> it's funny because i i'm very type a i like to have plans um i'm very scheduled out but this lifestyle has really taught me to go with the flow uh be more open to experiences and where we're going and it's very freeing to not have a stopping point in mind um i do know that we want to hit the lower 48 um there's a lot of like every time I feel we go to a new location, there's additional things we want to see and do. Mm -hmm. So like our list just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And I just don't see us stopping um, anytime soon. And, you know, that could change. I could wake up tomorrow and be like, I'm done. But for right now, no end in sight. <laughs> so you mentioned lower 48. Do so you have one of those little maps on the side of the RV that you fill in the blank every time you uh, yeah. get it? Yeah, we got 29 states. You got 29 done. Oh, yep. okay. So you're more than halfway. Yeah. Um, where do your um, next few months take you, Kaylee? Yeah, so we're going to go up to um, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Um, and then we're going to do 4th of July in Ohio. And so kind of stay up in that like upper Midwest. Um, and then I think we'll go kind of east, like lower east coast and kind of down. We were going to go see the fall leaves, but plans changed. <laughs> and so we're still filling out our fall schedule for now. Okay. Now, um, a lot of people travel with dogs. Do you? I do. Yeah, he's right there. <laughs> does he move? He does not not a whole lot. He's a little bit older. <laughs> so he's okay. Uh, okay. almost that, 10. And <laughs> that's another question that, um, you know, people who have dogs say, oh, I can't do the dogs and the kids at the same time. It's one or the other. But I, I guess you had the dog before the kids um Close yeah so yeah yeah we've had he's actually like right in between the kids when we first started we actually had two 60 pound dogs um but shortly after we had started um we had to put one down yeah two 60 pound dogs yeah yeah <laughs> we you were, over, you were overweight you were yeah. overweight so what advice would you have for other people that are out there whether they're retirees whether they're your age whether they're younger than you whether they're single married divorced uh whatever that are contemplating hitting the road, you know, not necessarily selling it all. I mean, you did sell it all, right? Mm -hmm. We did. Um, but they want to hit the road and try it for six months um, or a year. What, what, what's your advice? I say do it. Um, you know, if you aren't fully like set in to, you know, sell it all and, and do it and dive in fully, that's okay. You don't have to, but I think you need to try it to see if you're going to like it. So you can watch as many YouTubes as you want. You can follow Instagrammers. You can try to get a glimpse into the lifestyle, but until you're actually doing it, you don't know if it's going to fit for you. And if it doesn't, that's okay. And if it does, awesome. Like awesome. just, you can have it. You guys have a YouTube channel that, that tells you a lot of things like, like how to install a toilet. <laughs> yes, yes, we do. 
<laughs> so we yeah. are um, exploring outside the 303 on all of our channels. So we're on uh, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. And we should let people know that you are in your in your um, RV right now. I can see cars going by those side windows. Here. <laughs> That's a slide out behind you. Yes. Yeah, I'm up in my bedroom. Okay, great. So we want to thank you so much. Please give our best regards to your husband and the kids and the dog. And um, we want to let you know that you have been watching Exploring Outside the 303 right here on the Camper Report Show. Thank you so much for having me.